Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. I want you to think about some of your all-time favorite movies or books, all right? And think about kind of the familiar strain of so many of them. You've got a, an unlikely hero who's embarking on this journey, this quest, right? And they find themselves in peril. They're not real sure. They're ill-trained. They're ill-prepared. And they're not sure how they're going to make it through. But while they're on that journey, they come across a person, a mentor, who helps give them skills and tools and, and aid so that they can go onward in their journey, right? So let's think about a few of these. Where would Steve Rogers, who's Captain America, if you're unfamiliar, where would he be without Dr. Erskine, the one who created the super soldier serum? Uh, how could, uh, you know, <laughs> how could Luke Skywalker ever become a Jedi Knight without Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? Or let's never forget how much Rocky Balboa needed Mickey Goldmill. How could Harry Potter have ever defeated Voldemort if it wasn't for the help of Dumbledore? Or how could Katniss Everdeen have ever outsmarted President Snow without the help of Hamish Abernathy? I mean, where would Frodo Baggins be without Gandalf, right? Or Jonathan Wallace without Hunter Upton? <laughs> Well, maybe not, maybe not the last one, but, but you do understand where we're going here. All of those heroes had, had one thing in common. They had a hero maker. Uh, heroes are made. They're not born. All of these people, they're ill-equipped. All these characters, they're ill-equipped to the journey that they're going to have, the, the demands that were placed upon them until a hero maker comes into their lives and he provides them wisdom, direction, guidance, gives them tools and courage so that they can soldier on. Every hero needs somebody who can see in them what they cannot see in themselves. So good morning. My name is Hunter Upton. I'm the associate pastor here at Get Well Church South Haven. Uh, if you're joining us today, either on campus or online, however, wherever, we're just so delighted, so great, uh, greatly overjoyed uh, that we get to worship together on this Sunday morning. Now this morning we're continuing in our sermon series called Catalyst, where we're looking at the early church. Uh, we're looking at how the Holy Spirit is at work in the early church, circumstance and situation after circumstance and situation, event after event, day after day, bringing about new life that could not happen otherwise. We're looking at how they find themselves and how they, how they dealt with issues and things and how those apply to our lives today. And so this morning... We're talking about hero making. Now you may be thinking, Hunter, what in the world are you talking about with hero making? I'm so glad you asked that question, so let's answer it. Here, I've got a definition. This is what hero making is. A hero maker is a person who shifts from being the hero to making others the hero in God's unfolding story. All right, let's unpack this. Let's dissect this statement. First is that a hero maker is a person, right? Look around with me. I see a lot of persons. So that's all of us. All right, it's glad that we've cleared that up. That's a simple part of the statement. A person. A hero maker is a person. Second is who doesn't like the idea of being a hero, right? I mean, we love heroes. We celebrate the stories. We tell them time after time, real life heroes. Most of our news programs, if you're watching the nightly news, it always ends with this, this celebration of a hero, right? Um, you know, whether it's 
someone saving someone from a burning building or, or a group of people that go and save someone who's been swept out in the rip current. Uh, maybe it's a war hero who helped save his entire platoon. I mean, you name it. The thing is that we love these stories, and especially as children. We all dream of that, that one day when there's going to be that one heroic act that we get to do and, and just how awesome that's going to be. Well, I don't think that we necessarily lose the sense of, of being the hero. I think that it just kind of makes a shift uh, in, in our lives as adults. I think that, that we take on a different posture, one that we begin to see that the weight of the world is on our shoulders. All right, let me know if some of these uh, things resonate with, resonate with you. My coworkers depend on me because there's no one else who can do what I do. Mm. If, if I'm not the leader, if I don't take this by the horns, how else are we going to get it done? And especially, how are we going to not get it done like I want it done? Right? Who else is going to keep this family together if I'm not the one to do it? Do you see what I'm saying? I think that, that sometimes the idea of hero takes a, takes a different stance in our lives. I think that we fall trapped to, to that we're to be the heroes of our lives. We're to be the hero in the lives of those around us. But that's not how God actually intended it to be. That's because we have to be hero makers. We're making others the hero. All right, then the third part that I think is equally important in this statement is this. In God's unfolding story. In God's unfolding story. God is at work in the world. And since the entrance of sin in our lives by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the very beginning of the book, the, this book that we have that we see of history, um, we see that God has been at work bringing about his plan of redemption in the world. Since the climax of, of the redemption that's happened, that process, that unfolding story, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has given us a calling and a command as his people to take that good news of Jesus to the world. It's so that, what can they do? So that they can join in God's unfolding story. That's what we're to do. We're to bring them in so that they can see and experience the reality of the kingdom of God here and now, the transformation that God brings from his life that he wants to give. Now, you can look around and you can see that the world is not fully redeemed yet, right? Like, I don't know if you, I mean, you probably got cut off in traffic this morning on the way here. I mean, y'all, we still got a lot of work to do. But here's the thing. God is inviting each and every one of us into the work of redemption that he's doing in this world. And he invites us to bring others into that same redemptive work as well. So there's a scriptural example, and that's where we're going to be today, of this hero-making process in action. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse 1. If you've got a Bible or a device, Acts chapter 18, verse 1. Let's read from there. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul wanted to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. When Paul left the synagogue and, the next, uh, and went next door to the house of Tidius Justice, a worshiper of God, Crispus, the synagogue leader in his entire household, believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night... The Lord spoke to Paul in a vision, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Now skip down to verse 18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. So what's going on here? 
As Paul is traveling on his missionary journey, he's doing what God has called him to do. But here's the thing, he's making the most of being with the people that he comes in contact with. Last week we saw how the people that Paul came in contact with, he shared the gospel with them. And he did so in different ways so that it spoke to each of them uniquely. And now we see that no matter where he finds himself on his journey, as he enters a new city or goes to a new place, he's sharing his life and his message with those around him. No matter where we are, no matter where we find ourselves, there's this thing called a sphere of influence. It sounds a little mystical, right? Sphere of influence. But it's true. We all have a sphere of influence, a a, a connection with others that we come in contact with, people that we rub shoulders with, uh, people that, that we wipe the snot from their faces. I mean, you name it. There's so many ways that we come in contact with those in our lives, and we have some influence on them. If you were like, Hunter, I'm not sure that you're right. Well, let me explain it in this illustration. How many of you have a dog? A couple of people have a dog. And if you have a dog that sheds... You know all about this. If you have a dog that sheds, you find out that they, uh, when you put on your formal attire and you show up at the wedding and you are covered in dog hair, right? Or you take them to the vet and there's dog hair all over your seats. Uh, or, Or maybe even you sit down on the couch and it's, of course, the couch they're not supposed to be on. And guess who's been on the couch, right? Their hair goes with you everywhere. It's the same way with us and those around us. We rub off on those around us. They take a little bit of us with them. We have some impact on them. That is your sphere of influence. And so Paul, as he's going, is making the most of this process um, of, of rubbing off in his sphere of influence. Now, Paul seems like a hero to us, right? Uh, We always talk about how there's heroes in the Bible, heroes of the faith. But here's the thing, Paul is just carrying out a process that he had, had, that he had seen modeled in the life of Jesus. Jesus had, had 12 young men that he poured his life into. Jesus, yes, a hero, but Jesus was a hero maker, making heroes of those. Because if it wasn't for, those, for his pouring into those 12 men, for the investment that he made, none of us would be sitting here today. Jesus modeled for us, and Paul picks up on that model of hero making. Paul, even though he's got some great stature, he is a a leader in the church, he was creating heroes out of others. Now, Paul had three things as he entered Corinth in our text today. First is this, Paul had a purpose. Paul had a purpose. And if you've been with us since the start of this Catalyst Sermon series, we've referenced this verse here, Acts 1-8, several times. Um, And it's a definitive command by Jesus. In Acts 1-8, Jesus says, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's focus in on this. And where this statement really comes from is Matthew 28. Uh, The very end of Matthew's gospel, right before Jesus is taken up, uh, he expands on this command in a way of how you're to do this, this is what it looks like. And so none of this would have been unfamiliar to Paul. But this, you will be my witnesses, gave Paul a purpose. It gave Paul a purpose to share with others, to witness to the world that Jesus Christ is Lord to give them the good news of Jesus that they are no longer bound in their sin. It's no longer shackles around their necks and arms and legs. They're no longer bound by whatever is in their mind, keeping them back from understanding and loving Jesus and God with all of their hearts. The Holy Spirit's power unleashed on all humanity because of Jesus's great sacrifice. That's the message that Paul is to take to the world, that we are to take to the world. And so Paul, even though, yes, this statement wasn't given specifically to him, he wasn't present, he wasn't present here, he wasn't present at Matthew 28, but he knew that what Jesus had said was for all of his followers. This was a command that all of Jesus' followers were to carry out, to be witnesses, to be witnesses of the good news. Paul knew what it'd be, he had been entrusted with. He knew the message of the good news, and he knew that it was bigger than him. 
It was bigger than his to keep for himself. He had to tell others. Paul had a purpose. Second is that Paul had a passion. Paul had a passion. And if you've been reading through our reading plan with us, uh, we've highlighted almost the entire book of Acts by this point and many of Paul's letters. And so it's not hard to see that if you've ever spent any time in Paul's letters to see that this man really had a passion. The way that he lived was so passionate. Paul's missionary journeys, it was a result of, of his purpose, but also his passion to take the good news of Jesus to the world. So if we look again at Acts 1.8, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and where? To the ends of the earth. This passion to take the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth lit Paul on fire. Paul had his eyes set on Rome. It was the center of the Roman Empire. It was where the emperor was. Can you imagine the impact that could have on the known world? That's where he wanted to go. But guess what? He wanted to go even further. Paul desired to go to Spain, which at that time was the very end of the known world, to the ends of the earth. Paul had a passion. Paul had a purpose. He wanted to go this passion that he had was for others to know Jesus. And the way that he spoke, the way that he carried himself, all exuded that, that this passion was there. He never backed down from, from being truthful and honest, from sharing his life with others. It would have been really easy. I mean, we've seen multiple times in the book of Acts how easy it would have been for the early church to kind of shrink back, to re retreat, right, to become reclusive. And yet they didn't in the face of opposition, in the face of hardship, in the face of the situations and circumstances that they found themselves in, they pressed forward. Paul, he received these words from the Lord, right? Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. Those words sound very familiar if you've ever read through any of the Gospels, right? Jesus, our Savior, the one who gave us this command gives us these words of comfort that we can continue in our spark of passion to do what he has called us to in our, in our purpose. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. These are words for us to hold on to, words to go forward with. They're words that keep that spark of passion alive in our lives. So it's with this, this purpose, it's with this passion that then Paul focuses on a person. Paul had a person. Or in this case, in our text that we read just a minute ago, persons, right? Persons. I mean, what good is it is if we have a, a purpose and if we have a passion, but we don't do anything at all with it? Man. As Paul is going along from Athens to Corinth, he crosses paths with this husband-wife team, Aquila and Priscilla. And, you know, this is not the first time that Paul has poured into others. Uh, in that same text, we saw the names Timothy and Silas. These are two young men that Paul has been pouring his life into. Paul partners with Aquila and Priscilla, and he shares his very life with them. With his purpose and his passion, Paul undoubtedly would have included them as he taught each and every week in the synagogue and eventually in the house next door, right? Can you imagine the kind of dinner table conversation they had? But it was enlightening and thoughtful. Paul sharing his life, Paul using to the benefit of the kingdom his sphere of influence that he had. Paul wasn't going to waste the time that he had here on the earth. He knew that what he had been entrusted with was bigger than him. He knew the joy of knowing Jesus, of following Jesus, and being transformed by Jesus, and he wanted to share that with others. Paul wanted to build others up who would build others up. And once Paul's time in Corinth was, was up, he took Aquila and Priscilla with him onward into his journey. We found that in verse 18. You see, these were people in Paul's life, if even just for a season, but he wanted to make sure that he would make heroes out of them. And it wasn't so that he could stand on some mighty platform and say, I've made heroes out of others because then that makes you a hero, right? No, 
It wasn't for his glory. It was for the glory of God, for the kingdom of God. Now, even though Paul had poured into Aquila and Priscilla, uh, he knew that it was time to part ways. And what we find later in Acts 18 is that he leaves them while he's on his journey. He leaves Aquila and Priscilla in uh, Ephesus. And he goes on. But here's where the real beauty picks up. It's where the real beauty happens. This investment isn't going to be for nothing. These years that he had spent, literally years, walking alongside, rubbing shoulders with, pouring into, investing himself into Aquila and Priscilla, would not come back void. If you've got your Bible open, turn with me. Acts chapter 18, we're going to pick up in verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of, Jesus, of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Now Aquila and Priscilla, they had been given the ability to be heroes because of the action of a hero maker. They were equipped and they were ready to model for Apollos, would have been modeled for them. And this seems so upside down to our world, right? To the way that it's supposed to work. We invest our lives into others so that they make a kingdom impact. And here's the thing, that impact is often even greater than the impact that we can make ourselves. And so Paul did so with Aquila and Priscilla, who are now doing so with Apollos. And friends, that made such a great impact, such a huge impact, such an exponential investment for the kingdom of God. We read that Apollos, he became a huge part of spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus, by his gift of apologetics and, and speech. But he couldn't have gotten there if it wasn't for someone stepping aside from being the heroes themselves and becoming hero makers. I think that would have been really easy for Aquila and Priscilla to be like, hold on, Apollos. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You go sit over there, and when the time is right, when we're ready to retire, you can come on up, and we'll, we'll let you then do your thing. I think that would have been easy. But instead, they invested in Apollos, and they saw the impact that he would make. They invested in Apollos just as Paul had invested in them. So I don't want you to miss this. Don't miss this. When we devote ourselves with our purpose and passion to pouring into a person or persons, then we can always know that God is at work bringing about a what? An exponential investment for the kingdom. An exponential investment for the kingdom. Now, I am not a big math whiz. Um, my report cards would reflect that. But... Let's talk about this word exponential. It is a math concept. There are others in the audience who could do better at explaining this than me. Um, but it's a mathematical concept of exponents. And when you apply that exponent to a number, it begins to radically and rapidly increase. All right? So hang with me here. I'm going to try to explain it. 2 squared equals 4. It's 2 times 2. Uh, 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. 2 to the fourth power, all right, is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, which is 16. So you see how this number begins to just exponentially grow, right? Um, it's something that grows at a rapidly expanding rate. So what happens when we, when we combine purpose and passion with a person? Is we see a huge impact for the kingdom of God. An exponential investment from hero making. Now what's important to remember here, how, how do we get started? What's important to remember is this truth, is that the gospel comes to us on its way to someone else. I said this several months ago, 
And it's still true. The gospel comes to us on its way to someone else. Friends, someone out there needs to hear the gospel, and they need to hear it through you. Someone out there needs to see the gospel, and they need to see it through you. The gospel is not ours to keep. It's not exclusive to us. This life change that God can bring is not just ours. We want to give it to the world. The gospel comes to us on its way to someone else. So who is it in your sphere of influence that God has placed in your life that they need to hear the gospel through you? Maybe it's a person that already knows the gospel. Maybe they're kind of like Apollos, but yet what they need is someone to sit down, to walk alongside them, to to share with them how and more more accurately and, and guide them through life a little more steadily so they can grow and become a hero that then becomes a hero maker themselves. Maybe it's your grandchild. Maybe it's a young person down the road from you or, or in here right now. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe they need to discover how, how you connect your faith with how you do life. How do you live in this world? Maybe they need to connect how do you, how do, you do the job that you do well into the glory of God? How do you love your family well? Maybe they just need you to be the one who comes alongside and makes a hero of them. You might be at the point today, though, where you're that person that needs someone to pour into you. And if that's you and and you're not sure where to go from here, maybe you're a little too afraid to just go up to someone in here and say, hey, do you mind walking alongside me? If, If you're not sure where to go and you need some help, reach out to us, email us, call us, come by, whatever. I want to get you connected with someone who can do that for you. But I think for many of us, we're at that point in the road, in life, in time, in this season where it's time for us to answer that call, to pour into another person, to become a hero maker of them. Now, I think the answer is unique for each of us of how we, how we are to do this. And so that's why I've left some space. If you had a bulletin today on the outline, there's some space for you to, to pray about, to think through to allow the Holy Spirit to guide you as you think about who is that person? How do I want to do this? How do I want to walk alongside them? But I want you to write it down. And here's the thing, there's no better time to start than now. No better time to start than now. No better time to start than now. You may not feel qualified. I can't tell you how many times I've come to things in life and go, Lord, I am not qualified for this. And yet what God calls us to is obedience. He calls us to be obedient, to walk in that direction as he's called us to do, as he's commanded us to. And we can hear the words as he says, do not be afraid for I am with you. Let's take a risk. Let's see what God can do through it. So what you need to do is maybe reach out to him and say, hey, I would love to grab coffee or lunch with you. And just see where God takes it from there. Make it a recurring meeting. Let's see how God can take and change and lead and do wonderful things. Can you imagine the impact that that would have on our church, on our community? God wants to work in and through this idea of hero making for his kingdom, for his glory. And friends, he invites us into that work and what a wonderful and awesome responsibility and privilege that is. But I do want to give you one word of caution. Sometimes we think that by us investing our lives in others, that the fruit should come out of that. Out of our labor, surely this person will follow the Lord more more deeply or they'll be on the right path or this or that. But the truth is, is our only responsibility is to be faithful and obedient to what God has called us to to pour into other people. I want you to look at the words of Paul. Uh, This is what he says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians. This is sometime after Apollos has also been in ministry. I planted the seed. 
Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither it is the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who water, the one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they each will be rewarded according to their own labor. Friends, we're not anything. We're just the waterer or the planter. But it's God's spirit who comes and makes grow. And so when you find yourself possibly at a point where you've poured days and weeks and months and years of your life into another person and yet they seem so kind of closed off to it, don't be discouraged. God's spirit is at work when we are faithful to what he has called us to do. We have to trust his spirit is at work and that our investment will not return void. It can be difficult. It can be hurtful and painful when you find yourself in that place. But you can trust that God is work even when you don't see it. So kind of bring in this full circle. Just like those characters we saw at the beginning of the sermon. Heroes are made. They're not born. And behind every hero is a hero maker. And here's the honest truth, is that someone out there needs you. Don't think it's somebody else. They need you. So let's do this. Let's mix those ingredients of of purpose and passion and a person together and let's see what God is gonna do with it as we make heroes out of others for his kingdom and his glory. Jesus said these words that the harvest is plentiful. So let's get out of here and let's start making some heroes. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your gospel. Lord, we are grateful for the good news that we can have life and we can have it abundantly because of your son, Jesus. Lord, help us not take that lightly, what we have experienced as your people, as your church. Lord, there are people that are hurting. There are people that are lost. There are people that aren't sure where to go from here. And Lord, they need us. There are people sitting next to us that need someone to to pour into their lives, to help equip them for the journey that they're on, Lord, to make a kingdom impact that's greater than even the one that we will make. Lord, help us to be people who wrap our minds and our lives around this idea of hero making for your glory, Lord, and for the exponential impact that it will make on the kingdom of God as we are invited into the work of bringing about redemption here on the earth until the day that you, your son Jesus returns and we experience full redemption on that glorious day. Lord, point out to us that that person in our sphere of influence that we need to rub shoulders with and be intentional about pouring into. Lord, we love you and we praise you and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.